Welcome to Carolyn's Sunday School class. Hi class, this is Carolyn Holland from Carolyn's Sunday School class. Well, here we are again, and we've been traveling with Moses and the children of Israel through the um, wilderness. And um, we previously, back at the beginning of June, when it was Pentecost Sunday Shavuot, we did a lesson on when God gave the law and all the ups and downs of Moses receiving the law. So we're not, I'm not going to go through all of that. So basically we're going to skip to, um, Exodus 18 and 19 and jump right into 20. And, and the idea of what I want us to think about today is uh, rules and authority. Why? And who's in charge? All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your life, for your love. I thank you that you are in charge. I thank you that you are on the throne. When everything in this world seems to be so chaotic um, these last few months and, and we don't understand why everything is happening the way it is happening, Father, I thank you that we can know that you are on the throne and you are in charge. I pray that you would lead us and guide us through this lesson as we study your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we are. Before we get into the word, I want us to think about this um, idea here, authority and who's the boss. Now, years ago, like thousands of years ago, um, there were kings. Um, they had different names for the kings. In Egypt, the kings were called Pharaoh. Um, other places, I'm not sure what they were called. A king is a monarch. He's one guy that's in charge, and whatever he says is the law. It's not necessarily a written law. I think Hammurabi, back in, way back, uh, I think around the time of Abraham, had some laws in his kingdom. I'm not sure all the ins and outs of that. But all the way back to the beginning of time, after... Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden. There were people that took charge. They were, um, and they were the ones who were in authority, and they were the boss. I don't know if any of you remember being a little kid, or maybe you've seen a little kid about three or four years old that's starting to feel all important, and then they tell their parents, you're not the boss of me. And even as little kids, we understand that we don't want to be told what to do, and yet we want to tell other people what to do. So I want us to look at some people that are in authority. Um, I put some things on here, a crown, a gavel, Ten Commandments. But let's look at people in authority in our world now today. Now we, we don't, there still are kings in this world, excuse me, kings and queens, but there are a lot of presidents. So um, in our nation we have a president. He is an elected official. Okay. We have a governor, Texas Governor Greg Abbott. There he is. He's also elected. He's a person in authority in our state. There's lots of others. There, we could be here all day and just saying their names. We're not going to do that. Here in Hidalgo County, we have Judge Richard F. Cortez. He's the one, I think, that issues the orders that we should all wear masks or, you know, things that have to do with things in our county, in Hidalgo County. And then um, there are mayors. There are three mayor mayors of our surrounding towns. We have uh, Mayor Jim Darling of McAllen, Mayor Beto Salinas of Mission. I forgot to write Mission up there. And Mayor Richard Molina from Edinburgh. And under, obviously, each town has their... their um, mayors that are elected officials and then they have also city council members and other people that govern that are in charge that are the authorities then we also have parents all of us had parents um, police officers principals of your school teachers all of these are um, people that are in authority why do these people have authority well some of them like like our president, President Trump, and our governor, our elected officials. I'm not, I guess our county judge is elected as well. Some federal judges are appointed, like the Supreme Court judges are appointed by whoever is president at the time. Mayors are elected by the people. So are our city council members. 
your parents aren't elected. You're born to them and you're stuck with them unless, you know, their other arrangements have been made. But you will have somebody in the position of parents, whether they're your birth parents or adopted parents or foster parents or an aunt and uncle that's raising you. There's still parents that are involved in raising a, um, a young person, a child. And then police officers are hired. They go apply for a job. They get special training and they're poli they um, are there police uh, policing the area. They are authorities. And if you bump into them, you should um, respect them and do what they say. And you're less likely to, to have any problems. The principal of your school is an authority. Nobody elected him, but he applied for he or she applied for the job and was given the job and they are in that position of authority over the school. Not only do the students need to respect that authority, but so do the teachers and the um, custodial staff, the cafeteria staff. Everybody that works in the building has to respect the authority of the principal. Teachers are also hired. They apply, they go for special training as does the principal. And then they graduate, they get their degree, and then they apply for a job and they are hired into that position. And they are in a position of authority. Okay, so now, before we... Um, so when, when do these people have authority? Well, parents have authority over you until you're all grown up and move out of the house. Even if you're 25 years old, if you're still living at home, your parents have a certain amount of authority over you because it's their house. Um, policemen, teachers, judges, they, they um, have authority while they are in their position. I used to teach elementary school for many years. I'm not a, an elementary school teacher anymore. I no longer have authority in those classrooms. I did while I was there, but I don't anymore. Policemen likewise and judges and um, pre, uh, presidents while they have, while they're in authority. So a teacher is, has authority over you while you're in their classroom, but if you bump into them in HEB, they don't have authority over you. Likewise, um, the judge, um, your parents always do. The, there are some people that only while they are in uniform doing their job do they have authority, and then when they're out of uniform, then they don't have that direct authority. But elected officials, like the president or the mayors or the um, governors, they have authority during the term that they're elected for, be it two years, four years, six years, or however long they've been elected, they have that authority that when they go home, they still have the authority that's been vested in them. And in our United States, we have, this is um, the Constitution of the United States. This is the governing document. This tells each pers elected person what they can and cannot do, what authority they have and don't have. So, so who's the boss? And where did all that authority come from? It's just really natural, you know. Um, kids, a group of kids can go out onto the playground, and if you watch them long enough, eventually one of them is going to come out as the leader, the authority over that game, and all the kids will do whatever that one says. It, it's We have a natural need to have leaders. When there are no leaders, we have something called anarchy. And when people are going crazy and refusing to obey laws, we have anarchy. Do you think that anarchy is something that God desires or designed? I don't think so. Anarchy means no law, no rules. And while it seems fun when you're a kid to think, yeah, I, I don't like rules, really, we do need them. And if you've ever been in a classroom, like for example, you have a classroom with your substitute teacher, um, it's a little chaotic, and if you have to have that substitute for several days in, the row, in a row, you're really glad to get your real teacher back because the real teacher comes in with real authority and sets things in order. And, and unless a person is abusing that authority, that feels a whole lot better. Okay, so where did the authority come from? If we merely evolved, as some people say, well then, why would we have any more rights than a fish or a dog? And my dog thinks she's the boss of me, and she yaps at me and tells me what to do. Well, I have to put her in her place from time to time because I am, I am the boss of her, and she has to know that. Okay. Um, 
but we always tend to put people in charge and there's a reason for that let's look at Romans 13 1 let me see if I have it here Romans 13 1 says let every be soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God Wow and and you know Paul, um, the Apostle Paul wrote this during a time when Nero was the emperor of the Roman Empire. Nero did not like Christians. Nero was a really mean guy. And Nero abused his authority, um, especially over Christians. He persecuted them without mercy. And yet Paul said that we are to submit to that authority. Okay, so obviously he didn't mean... Um, the emperor says we're not to worship God, so um, I'm going to stop worshiping God. No, that's where you have to draw the line. But when the governor says you have to pay some taxes or, or the, um, you know, you have to do certain things a certain way, well, he's the emperor, he's the boss, and you are to be subject to him. And it's and it says no, there's no authority except from God. So every authority, whether you like that authority or don't, whether they're a good authority or maybe they abuse their authority, the actual authority that they have comes from God. And they are appointed by God. Now sometimes you say, well, why does God allow bad authorities? Sometimes God allows bad authorities because there has been a lot of sin and there's a lot of bad stuff going on. The people want to sin and the people want to do things that are contrary to God. And so God says, okay, here's a bad ruler Maybe you'll dislike him and you'll do something about it, you know. Maybe you'll straighten up your behavior and your next ruler will be better. Maybe somebody will come along and get rid of this one. I don't know what exactly how God thinks, but I know that this is the word of God, and so we need to keep that in mind. Um, let's see. Why do you think God has the ultimate authority? Well, it's because... God has the ultimate authority because he is the creator. He created you. If he created you, doesn't he have the right to tell you what to do? Of course he does. He created the whole wide world. So does that mean he has the right to tell the whole wide world how it should be? Of course he does. And um, the enemy, Satan, and all of the fallen realm that, that are with him, um, have usurped that authority. They've tried to take that authority away. And God limits it. They can only do so much. But eventually, God is going to come over, come along, and judge them. He is also our Savior. He, he um, Yahweh is Yeshua. He is our salvation. So he came and he died on a cross to save us. So that also gives him the right of authority. In fact, Jesus said, after he rose from the dead, that all authority had been given unto him in heaven and in earth. So he is the ultimate authority. So we must submit to authority. Okay, what is, are there official documents that specify the authority? Well, in the United States, we have the Constitution. That's our authority in the United States. And that's why um, people are always saying, well, is that constitutional? Our authority um, scripturally ultimately comes from God. And we're going to look today at the Ten Commandments. Okay, because when we rebel against authority, we're actually rebelling against God. So let's examine, re-examine the foundation of God's laws called the Ten Commandments. And actually, these are the, um, the foundation of almost all of the laws in the world. Uh, um, are based on this our constitution is as well i'm going to take this down because we're going to go back to sinai and um as we go through this so if you'll excuse me while i take down my toys okay these are some scriptures we'll get to at the end um let's see could you turn that light off then please I'm going to bring back the mountain because if, if you remember, God has been up in the mountain. God has been up in the mountain and he's been talking and 
a booming voice and the people below heard his every word and um, I don't think there was any green or blue lights but watch what happens when we boom the voice with this flasher let's see let me read the commandment okay do not worship any other gods do not make any idols do not take the name of the Lord in vain keep the Sabbath holy honor your father and your mother do not murder do not commit adultery do not steal do not lie do not covet and the Word of God says that God spoke to them and they heard the thunderings they heard his voice they didn't see anybody and and that's God's point later on they didn't see anybody so we're going to go ahead and turn this off and go ahead and talk about the the Ten Commandments let me see will this stay like that no so let's just um, quickly go through them I don't know what time I started so I don't know what time I'm going to end but I don't want to go much over 30 minutes so I hope everybody will stick with me we're going now to Exodus chapter 20 I really think this is an important topic because right now people are challenging authority right and left and I don't believe that that is something that pleases the Lord when we challenge the authorities that he has placed there all right so we have the first three verses for the first commandment is um, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage you shall have no other gods before me so in other words there is one God his name is Yahweh Elohim and we are only to worship him he's manif he manifested in the flesh in in as Jesus Christ Yeshua and the Father and the Holy Spirit is one God manifesting in three persons that's really hard to understand so we take it by faith but there's evidence of each personality throughout Scripture and so as you read you'll see that that we're not to have any other gods that means no Buddha none of the old gods like Zeus or Jupiter Kronos um, not worship the Sun or the moon none of that only Yahweh Elohim he never showed himself as any form we are not to make statues of Jesus we're not to pray to statues of Mary or to statues of any Saints no that is that is the first commandment and God said no don't do it um, and then verse 2 I mean the second commandment verses 4 through 6 you shall not make yourself a carved image and you are not to bow down to them nor serve them so no statues big or small of Saints gods animals to worship or you're not to pray to candles or light candles to to these Saints none none of that is allowed before God that is like the worst thing that you can do and so right now we're having a lot of stuff in the news about people toppling statues well um, I'm not so sure about historical statues because the Bible does say in other places to give honor to whom honor is due and so if we have historical like our presidents Abraham Lincoln that that um, uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation did away with slavery and we have different statues of of different people we're not worshiping them but it's and um, I, I don't know about those things but when they're knocking down a statue of Jesus their heart is wrong because they're thinking I hate Jesus I hate God and I'm gonna knock that thing down and and so their heart is against God but the fact is we should not have images that we think are images of God so that's something we need to take before the Lord now let's go to verse number seven you shall not take the name of Yahweh Elohim your Elohim in vain your God so if God is if if Yeshua Jesus Christ is your God you have repented of your sins and he is your God the words that come out of your mouth you should never use his name in vain you should never use the word um, God or Jesus or even um, golly or gosh that or G all of those are shortened forms of God and Jesus we should never use them as curse words that that is one form of taking his name in vain but another one is if 
if I say that I am a Christian and I put out these videos, people in my church, people that I've worked with, my neighbors know that I am a born again believer. But what if one of these days I get caught um, drunk in a bar? Heaven forbid I've never even been drinking any alcohol, so that's not likely to happen. What, what if it did? Then I would be um, blaspheming the name of the Lord because people would say, well, if that's a Christian, you know, I don't want to be like her. So our lives need to reflect God's love. And God's life and the way um, our life should sh should match up with God's laws we are under God's authority okay number four verses 8 through 11 say remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy I'll turn the page here remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy and here's the reason six days you shall labor and do all your work but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God in it you shall do no work and then it goes on to say, who's not going to work in your house? You can't, your daughter can't, your son can't, your slave can't, your donkey can't, your horsey can't, your dog can't. Nobody is to work on that day. It's to be a day dedicated to the Lord and to rest. Just as God ceased his work of creation on that seventh day, he did not continue creating. We are likewise to spend that time in rest and spend it in worshiping and honoring our Lord. Okay. Then, um, so those four are ones that, that govern our relationship with God and our, our worship relationship. Um, it seems really simple, but if you see in our world today, even if you examine yourself, how well do you um, make God number one in your life? That's something for you to ask God. Okay, then we get into how we deal with other people. Number five in verse 12 says, Honor your parents, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So here it's telling you that if you honor your parents, he will make your, your the time you live in the land he's giving you long. In um, Ephesians 6, 1, it says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right, and this is the first commandment with promise, that your days may be long uh, upon the earth. So he's promising a long life as well. To those that honor their parents okay and so in this thing if you're still at home under your parents um, protection um, your parents have every right to be your authority and you must obey them but let's say you're 35 years old and you're living on your own you do not have to obey your mom or dad but you do always need to honor them you always need you should speak well of them um, as as much as you can you should be thankful at least that they gave you life maybe I know there are cases where parents have been really super abusive of kids but even then you should try to find something for which you can be thankful for, to them for that at least they brought you into the world they gave you life and, and try to honor them to the best of your ability to the best of the that the relationship allows and that's what he's talking about there Say taking care of them, um, forgiving them. If they've done you wrong, then um, honoring them includes forgiving them for having hurt you. Okay, then we get on to um, number six. <clears throat> you shall not murder. In the King James, it says you shall not kill, and people have gotten confused about that, and they don't want to go to war. But there is a time. Um, if, if somebody's coming and is about to kill your mom or your little sister or something and your dad comes along and kills the perpetrator that's not wrong okay if in defense of your family in self self defense that is not wrong if your country is going to war and you're protecting your homeland then that is not what this is talking about this is talking about premeditated murder because you hate somebody so much your anger your rage is so much that you can't stand to see them live and in the new testament jesus says if you're if you even hate somebody with that kind of hate you're guilty of murder okay um then it goes on to number seven in verse 14 you shall not commit adultery <clears throat> so what that boils down to just a second 
What that boils down to is no sex outside of marriage. And by marriage means one man and one woman. God leaves no room for alternative lifestyles. He leaves no room for other um, orientations. There's only one orientation to God, and that is male and female. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28 say, somewhere it's here. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and da-da-da-da-da. So there God created just man and woman, and obviously there were just the two of them, so the two of them would be married. Um, <clears throat> also in chapter 2, verse 24, where God goes through the specifics of how Adam and Eve were created, in verse 24 he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so it's talking about a man getting married to a wife. <clears throat> Excuse me, we have people building a carport in front, and they they were at the door. Daisy. Shh. Okay, and the dogs, of course, have to announce it, so for, please forgive the interruption. Okay, also, um, committing adultery includes lusting after somebody. You see a handsome... A handsome guy or a guy sees a beautiful girl and he starts imagining in his mind what it would be like <clears throat> to be with her or him that is called lust and in God's eyes that is committing adultery in your heart so if you have done that then you are guilty of breaking this commandment and I want to say um, <clears throat> there are many reasons why people feel like they don't fit into this um, binary uh, situation that God created and that is usually because there has been some sin against them and they need help to get out of it if you're in this situation and you feel like um, God is pricking your heart and you know that you are wrong then it's time for you to get on your knees before God and say God please forgive me for um, living this lifestyle. Please forgive me for whatever it is that you've done in this department. Ask God to forgive you. That is submitting to God. Then you need to resist the devil. You need to say, tell every demonic spirit, every evil spirit that stirs you up to have these feelings, you need to tell them to leave you in the name of Jesus and you resist it. And you resist those feelings in Jesus' name. And if you need help, um, there are people that can help you with that, um, and we can um, we can get in touch with some that will help you um, if you have that problem. But God's word doesn't leave room for, um, well, this happened or that happened. No, He says no. You must stick to this. This is my plan, and it's the devil that has twisted things around. If God did not make you other than male or female. God made you according to his plan. It's the devil that has twisted it, and then he blames God. So, um, just a little bit on that. Now, um, number 8 in verse 15, it says, You shall not steal. Do not take what is not yours. Simple as that. If it doesn't belong to you, don't take it. That includes looting during a riot. If there's a protest, protests are fine, but if somebody starts getting angry and they break down a window of a business and they steal stuff out of the store that doesn't have anything to do with protesting that's stealing and that is sin <clears throat> cheating on a test is also a form of stealing because you're stealing an answer that you did not know number nine you shall not bear false witness you shall not lie in other words um, I learned a little rhyme when I was a little girl lie not Lie not one to another, not to your sister or your brother, not even to your father or your great-grandmother. Lie not one to another. Don't say what is not true, if you know it's not true. Now, sometimes uh, we say something that we believe is true, and then we find out the truth, and we say, oh, no, I lied. The truth is thus and so. 
Well, if you knew that, if you did not know that it was otherwise, it's not a lie. It's only a lie when you know the truth is something else and you um, pervert the truth. Okay, so number 10. It says, don't covet your neighbors, and it goes to a long list. Their, their house, their wife, their servant, their female servant, their ox, their donkey, or anything that's your neighbors. Okay, anything. Their, their brand new car, their car, brand new carport, their, their, uh, <clears throat> their puppy. Now, there's a difference between co um, coveting and admiring. Okay, so we admired um, somebody that got a new carport built down the street and so we hired those self same people to build one for us that is not coveting that is admiring and then going and getting it for yourself you see somebody has a pair of cool tennis shoes coveting means that you would try to steal them oh they were the same size as me and I can't afford to buy them so when they're not looking I'm gonna steal those gym shoes that's coveting and coveting leads to stealing and it will usually also lead to lying because you're going to have to lie about it to cover it up. So, no. But what is okay, it, wow, they, that person has some really cool tennis shoes and ask them where they got them and then save up some money to buy some for yourself. That's okay. But coveting, coveting is a foundational sinful desire that leads to, it can lead to adultery and stealing and lying. And so we don't want to do those things. <clears throat> so these are commandments from the Lord. Okay, here they are in short. Do not worship other gods. Do not make any idols to bow down to them. Do not misuse God's name or um, behave in a way that causes people to misuse his name. Keep the Sabbath holy. Today, I'm making this on Saturday on the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. And do not covet. These are the foundational laws, commandments that God gave. A commandment is not a suggestion. A suggestion is, well, if you want, you can do this or you can do that. That's not, God did not give suggestions here. <clears throat> um, these are the, these, um, all of these commandments, in some form or fashion or another, are part of our conscience as well. You may say, well, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to lie. But if somebody lies to you, you'll be plenty mad about it. So that means you know that it's wrong. Um, we, we all instinctively know these things are wrong. So what is the purpose of having these Ten Commandments? What is God's purpose in giving this to us? Well, um... <clears throat> One purpose is as a mirror. I'm sure all of you have had a mirror um, and you're outside playing in the mud or working and then you go and look at the mirror and you say, oh, I have mud splashed on my face. And, and you know you're getting ready to go out somewhere. You're going to go to the grocery store. Are you going to leave the mud on your face? No. Okay, well, um, the thing stopped running, so we're starting over. We're talking about being embarrassed about having mud on your face. And, of course, you're going to wash the, the mud right off. Okay, the same way, when we look into God's perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, we look at the commandments, and it shows us, I'm living a sinful life. I'm, I, I am doing some of these things. I'm not doing other of these things. I'm not loving God above all else. I'm not, I, I've dishonored my parents. Okay, I've, I've lusted after somebody. Whatever it is. Um, the Word of God shows you what is acceptable before God and what is not. And the idea is for you to come to repentance, for you to say, Dear Lord, please forgive me. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I have not obeyed you in these commandments. Please forgive me because I know Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Um, and so he says... The, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, so with um, your mouth, confession is made to salvation. With your heart, um, you, you believe. Okay, and so that is how you are to be saved. You, maybe you have already received Jesus Christ as your Savior, but you find that, Oh, wow, I really have broken some of those commandments lately. I hadn't really thought about it. 
And the Bible also says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So either way, we come to God asking him to forgive us for our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we can be more like him. And that is the goal of God's word and the Ten Commandments. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. And I hope that you will pray and ask him to forgive you of your sins and make him your Lord today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and care. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the commandments that show us how you want us to live. Father, I pray that you would speak to whomever listens to this. Lord, that you would bring them to repentance and bring them to salvation, bring them to sanctification, that they would grow in you. Thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye.